All right. Welcome back. No. Hope you had a good weekend. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, transducers and sort of begin the process of the analog circuit design uh, by looking at specifications we're going to need for that analog circuit. Again, this is in uh, the book. Uh, look specifically in chapter 10, section 2. Okay. Uh, the kinds of microphones, uh, the kinds of uh, uh, sensors that are little, that that you may encounter are measuring sound, okay. And there are two main ways that we can make. Well, there's probably more. Uh, there's the cheap and inexpensive way, which is an electret microphone, and I'll and I'll show you some circuits for that. Uh, more high fidelity microphones actually don't have an integrated circuit, but they're made out of capacitors, and so they have a different interface. So if you've got a, a, a capacitive microphone you're interfacing, it's a different circuit than the electret, although very similar. And a bunch of different ways to measure distance. Um, in the, in, you can use sound, you can use, uh, you can use light, you can use lights of various frequencies. And then in lab nine, we're going to measure temperature. And we're going to measure temperature with a thermistor, uh, but I'll compare the thermistor to the thermocouple in today's lecture. Okay, so uh, here's an electric microphone. Uh, this guy here costs about 50 cents. And so it's the, best mic it's the best sensor you can buy for 50 cents, so don't expect miracles from it. Um, if you are doing sound, uh, you may want to investigate uh, awesome ways to do signal to noise, to do noise uh, suppression in digital filtering. Um, but the way it works is there is a, a diaphragm here which moves out with the sound pressure and that diaphragm will then uh, cause a change in the sensor material so this is what's called a primary sensing unit primary sensing and then this is the secondary conversion so this is typical of a sensor to have a primary conversion. And what that will do is change, a, um, change the, the, uh, the behavior of this JFET. That's the, uh, so the primary, is the, the primary is the diaphragm and the secondary is the transducer. Uh, the transistor, which is going to be a function, the conductance of that transducer will be a function of the, um, uh, of, of the displacement, which means that as this wiggles back and forth, this wiggles up and down in voltage. Okay. Um, but it, it needs power, and so typically in an electret, we're going to give it a power. Uh, so we're going to give it a voltage in, uh, and this voltage in is going to produce a current in, and that current will, will bias or activate the transistor. So on top of the DC will be an AC. Okay. So again, it's an AC signal. And so if I look at this point here, something really bad happened. Something evil happened in the 445L world right there. And so explain what you know about a capacitor. It has two behaviors in the computer scientist thought, right? It behaves one way and another way. What are the two ways that capacitors behave? Open and short. Open and short, okay? At DC, it's a what? Open. It's open, okay? And at AC, where the sound is, it's a Sure. So if this signal has no DC, what does it look like? I'm actually going to put 10K here. What does this signal look like? A signal with no DC has what property? If DC, if the DC component of this signal is zero, what can you tell me about it? What is the mean? The mean has to be zero. Okay. Well, if the mean is zero, tell me some other properties. It what? It has to go up and down. 
right? It has to be both positive and negative. Now it turns out that we're powering our system with, with 0 and 3.3 .3 volts. So all of our circuitry, all of our circuitry is powered with 3.3 .3 volts and ground. And so a negative voltage is going to clip. That's a problem. Okay, we're going to fix it in the next slide. Okay. All right. And the way we're going to fix it is to bias it, to float it up to one half the power line. And so if this, um, if this, okay, here's just a sidebar. Uh, uh, the data sheet tells you to use a 2K resistor right there. That's what the data sheet will say. And my experimental observation is I get a much nicer sound wave at 10K. Uh, I don't know the physics of it, but it's just prettier. So you, when you get to lab, uh, when you get to lab eight and you're building it, you might try different resistors in that spot. No problem in lab seven, because when we get to lab 11, you can solder whatever you want in that spot. Okay, so again, this was that, this was the part, this was the, the, uh, this was the place that we drew on the other picture. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna force it to go to 1.65 volts, okay? By using a biasing technique, so if I look at this circuit, V2, right? This is not the same one I did before, okay? If I go back over here and I add these two 20K, 22K resistors, okay? Now, what is the DC response of this? Right? Think about that. The DC response of this circuit is what? I have a question there. Yeah, go. Uh, what part of the circuit did you say there was a zero DC? Okay, in the, where I've labeled, okay, uh, blue, V1, V1. Okay, how's that? Am I clear now? Okay. So what in my other circuit is not zero. The blue circuit here will make the average of V1 zero. But now that I've, uh, now that I've added the two resistors, I'm gonna call this V1 prime, okay? And it's going to be up here at 1.65. Okay. Ask the question again. I thought that it was the voltage across the capacitor no. would have no DC. No, 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 it's the opposite. Okay, think about, uh, he said the voltage across the capacitor would have no DC. Uh, he's wrong. What is the impedance of the capacitor at DC? You got it upside down. What's the, what's the impedance at DC? What is the impedance of the capacitor at DC? Infinite, so it can have a big voltage difference, right? It can have a big voltage difference. It's at high frequencies that the impedance will go to zero, in which case there'll be no, no, no voltage difference. So what I'm saying is the V1, the output V1, relative to ground, blue, okay, the output relative to ground of V1 will be zero without the two red resistors. When I add the two red resistors, it'll go to 1.65. So the sound wave will be floating up within, and so this guy here, right, with the blue circuit, this guy is very sad, okay? And with the red circuit, he's very happy because everything's within the, within the power line. So those two resistors are very pop, are very important. Okay. And now I have an amplifier, and we're going to talk about amplifiers uh, in, a, in a couple of lectures. Uh, but uh, this capacitor here will also cause this guy here to float to 1.65 volts. So if you look at that spot, that'll be 1.65 volts. And this amplifier is going to, is going to have a gain of 100. Uh, and it also is, is also a low-pass filter. And we're going to talk about the op-amp circuits in a couple of lectures.
Okay? So I just wanted you to, to, to get a sense of how we interface the electric. So questions on this circuit? Uh, what is the power supply rejection ratio of this circuit? Okay? That's, a, that's a parameter which is a measure of the ratio of power line noise. Okay? If I have a power line, if I have a 10 millivolt ripple on my 3.3 line, how much of that 10 millivolts is showing up in my output? Turns out all of it. Okay? Power line ripple is going to come right through here. Okay. So this is a bad circuit for, uh, for power supply rejection ratio. Okay, so the power supply and rejection ratio is the ratio of the power, power, the noise on the power line to the noise on your output from the power line. And so if you want lower, uh, if you want a lower, um, uh, uh, lower noise system, you can replace this with your shunt diode output. Right? So if you remember how you make a, uh, you could use a 2.5 volt shunt diode output and use it to power up your system. Uh, again, this circuit's acceptable as is. All right. Um, so in summary about the electret, uh, get the voltage right. Uh, the impedance is what they recommend for that, for that resistor. Uh, for the ones in my office, it's a 2K. But as I said, uh, uh, you might experiment with a larger value. You can either get a directional or a omnidirectional. I think all the ones in my office are omnidirectional. Um, yeah, why, if anybody noticed, uh, um, uh, anybody watched any of the YouTube videos? Okay. What happens when this guy squeaks his chair? Anybody notice? He's a squ chair squeak. I don't know. I don't know which one of you is squeaking the chair. You know who you are. Squeaking the chair on the YouTube videos. Yeah, somebody else. Yeah, he's pointing fingers. Do you hear it? Does anybody hear chair squeaking on the YouTube videos? Yeah. What what type of microphone did I buy? I bought an omnidirectional. <laughs> Next semester I'll buy I buy I'll buy I'll buy directional and that way you don't hear no chair squeaking. I'll figure this taping business out eventually. Right? Uh, sensitivity is an important parameter for transducers and when you think of sensitivity you think of this, uh, what, are, what is the input to this transducer? What's the input? Okay, the units of, of sound are what? By the way, fumes. Pressure. Pressure, sure. And what is its output? Voltage, okay. we just saw that. Okay. And so sensitivity is the, is the, is the, oh, 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 backwards, is the output over the input. And so the more sensitive it is, the better it can, uh, it can, it can pick up sound. Now it turns out to be uh, measured in decibels because they relate it to a specific uh, value, but you can use sensitivity when you're comparing one transducer to another as long as the units are the same. Uh, the last is the frequency response. Uh, again, the, the frequency response is the ones that we that are in the kit are not very good, and so it will have a low. F it will not pass low frequencies, so it'll have essentially um, two cutoffs. It'll have both a high frequency and a low frequency cutoff. Again, go ahead and get one of those data sheets. Uh, uh, who's got the black box of stuff? Okay, uh, pick out the one that looks like this and, and hold it up so everybody see. That's an ultrasonic transducer. We'll use it in 445M. You give it a pulse. Uh, this hold is actually pretty constant. And then you get an input, which is a function of the uh, speed of sound in air. Uh, and we measure that time. So the essence here is we need to measure time. Okay. Um, Another time measurement is the accelerometers. Accelerometers basically will generate a pulse or a frequency or a pulse width 
uh, which is a function of uh, acceleration. So this is a, a time measurement. And then who's got the box? Open, uh, public, lift up the one that looks like this. Uh, this one's got an awesome ability. Uh, look at this waveform. What if you read, uh, what if you read one and a half volts? How far away is the object? How far away is the object? You, re you read one and a half volts. It's so nice. You just hook it up and you read one and a half volts. How far away is the object? You see the problem? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it could either be right on top of you. You know, <laughs> object in the mirror are closer than they seem. You know? <laughs> or very far away. No, oh, no. <laughs> problem. So what you got to do is you got to recess. You got to recess this sensor away from the, the what you're trying to measure to make sure you don't get into that range okay uh, or you got to use some sort of history thing to see where you are um, otherwise this is a very nice curve it's just like the voltage is one over the distance so other it once it once it starts working okay uh, <clears throat> lab nine is going to use temperature okay who's got the box uh, lift up the thing that's smallest uh, it sort of, look, sort of looks like a bead with two, sort of looks like this. That's a thermistor. It's, it's, got, a, it's got a semi a ellipsoidal, uh, ellipsoidal um, uh, uh, tip. Uh, that one's coated in epoxy. Some of them are glass coated. The actual thermistor material is embedded in here. And it's got two leads on it. And uh, the input is temperature and the output is resistance. Um, we're going to show you how to interface that later, but uh, basically we have resistance. Uh, the thing about temperature sensors is they measure the temperature of the, of the sensor, not the temperature of the object. So it's measuring the temperature of whatever the center of this thing is. Okay. Um, uh, lift up the, the thing with the, with the weird wires, in, uh, the brown wires. The long uh, circular brown wires. Yeah, I'll hold that one up. Uh, look at uh, look at the uh, find on the brown wire. It looks something that looks like a ball. Okay. Can you see it? The yeah, the tip. Uh, that's a weld joint. Okay, so what we have are two dissimilar metals. We got metal one and metal two, and they're welded together at that spot. It's called thermocouple. And that dissimilar metal produces a Seebeck effect, and it gives us a uh, voltage output here. Uh, this is awesome. I, one, of the, one of my summer projects was to make a beer cooler. And so the essence was, you probably saw it on, uh, you know, uh, on, on one of the TV channels. But uh, was, uh, what's the fastest way you can cool beer? So I, I took a Peltier device. A Peltier device is thousands of these thermocouples all welded together in a row. Because uh, it turns out if you put voltage in, uh, the temperature difference will happen. So the way that thermocouples work is the temperature difference between this temperature and that temperature generates a voltage output. Whereas if you put a voltage in, it'll generate that temperature difference. So the point was how to make something cool really fast by using a whole bunch of these Peltier coils all around. So it was about 40 amps worth of power because it's essentially you're driving voltage into a short, right? It's, it's, a, it's wire welded together. There's no impedance in this whatsoever. Uh, and so that current in generated a, a temperature out and it cooled pretty fast. Yeah. For the thermistor, is there like one side that Uh, he, the question he asked is, where does it actually measure? And it, uh, actually, you know, I used to do, boy, it's, it's not going to be on the test. But, you know, there's some math involved. Do you really want to see it? I, I, I did this. This is something. Okay. Here's an interesting question. Okay. And that is, uh, what's the definition of a resistance? What's the definition of resistance? It's defined as what? Voltage over current. Okay. All right. So, all right. Voltage, that's the definition of resistance. Okay. 
So if I put in a voltage here, okay, where does the, and, and the, this is the, okay, so think three-dimensional. I got two cylindrical wires and a spherical semi semiconductor, which is what a thermistor is. You, sorry, you asked this question. I actually know the answer to this one. Okay. The answer is between the two wires. Is the, is the bottom, this is a shortcut answer. Okay, it's the temperature between the two wires. Because where does the current flow? If I were to draw the current, uh, are there any 325 guys in here? Right, this is Maxwell's equations. Where's the current flow? Uh, is, there a voltage, is there a voltage difference on the copper wire? Right? If you look at the, the, the three-dimensional uh, uh, potential down a copper, cylindrical copper wire, what can you tell me about the potential at all spots on the copper? Relative to semiconductor, right? copper is what? It's isopotential. So this voltage here is equal all the same. Okay? So now where's the current going to flow? You know, quickest way, right? It's going to flow this way. But if I look at it in the other dimension, where's the current going to flow? Where are the current lines? Yeah, it's going to be. Well, this is a 325 question. But the problem is, it's a function of the temperature. And so this flow here, this current line, is a function of the temperature at that spot, the temperature at this spot, the temperature at this spot, the temperature. So it's essentially a function of the temperature in here. Essentially, short, short answer, or long answer to a short question. Uh, the point is, it's uh, the same thing you can say about your uh, thermocouple. The temperature that it's measuring is the temperature of the weld joint. So if this is one material here, and this is the other material there, and it's welded together, that's the temperature it's measuring, the temperature at the weld. Uh, the only the, 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 the exception to the rule about where does it measure temperature is infrared. Right? You've seen the infrared cameras. You, know, they, you point it at somebody and you can tell what their temperature is. Now we're measuring the temperature of the surface of, what you're, of where that light comes from. Uh, sensitivity. All right, so I'm sorry, I got side chart. Okay, you should know what sensitivity is. Um, that is the ratio of resistance to temperature. It turns out that what we're going to use for thermistors is really 1 over R dr dt uh, because it will become a unitless. This is how we're going to compare one thermistor to another. So we're going to use thermistors because they're more sensitive. Um, uh, we would use thermocouples if we wanted to make it interchangeable. Um, uh, so it's more sensitive, which means we'll have better resolution, but it will require, um, will require calibration. And we'll get to these equations when we talk about lab 9. So in summary, the important part about a, um, in summary, the important part about a transducers is the sensitivity. So we have the input to the output, and the output is either uh, resistance, voltage, current, time, whatever, and the input is either sound pressure, temperature, distance, and this ratio of output to input is the definition of, of sensitivity. Uh, selectivity. is a measure of what else is your transducer sensitive to. So if, for instance, if your transducer is not measuring temperature, it will also be sensitive to temperature. And so uh, it would potentially have an error. Uh, other things that things are a function of, uh, they're, they're a function of temperature, they're a function of pressure, they're a function of vibration or acceleration. 
So their transducers are often sensitive to other things other than what you're trying to measure. Um, signal to noise ratio is, uh, is, uh, is going to be the biggest decision why your, how good your system works and not a function of how many bits your A to D converter is. And that's a measure of the noise uh, to the signal. Okay. We saw frequency response is a function of uh, the, of the, it's the sensitivity is a function of uh, frequency. And then we saw uh, three, four different things that we might want to have to interface. Um, the IR distance sensor was a voltage, okay? a DC voltage, so we need a DC amp. We saw the microphone was an AC voltage, so we needed an AC amp with offset. Uh, we saw uh, Bill Bard showed you how to do time. How do I do time? If I want to measure pulse width, what do I do? Magic words are in this class. Bard taught the lecture. Remember, he was here and he talked about weird stuff, and then he talks about interesting stuff, <laughs> or the other way around. I don't know your your pressure, you know. Input capture, right? Yeah, we're going to measure use input capture, and then for the resistance, we'll see. Uh, uh, we'll use a bridge, okay? And I'll show you show you that. So, in summary, this lecture was about the transducer. We want to choose the right one so it's sensitive of the thing I'm interested in and not sensitive to things I'm not interested in. And this transducer will come out with our specification uh, of how big your signal is, and therefore uh, we want it to map it to the 0 to 3.3 volt uh, ADC. All right, question?